Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. This is episode 23 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Chris Prefontaine. Chris, welcome to the show. Just want to say hi, and then I'll read your bio in. How are you doing? I am awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So Chris is actually the founder, CEO, and coach of Smart Real Estate Coach, four-time best-selling author of Real Estate on Your Terms, The New Rules of Real Estate Investing, and Sell with Authority for Real Estate Investors. Also the host of his own podcast, Smart Real Estate Coach. He's been in the business, like me, more than 30 years. Chris, I'm really glad to have you on the show. And the first thing I want to know is, how did you get involved in this crazy business that we've both been involved in for so long? I was going to say, first of all, there's not too many old farts that I get to talk to, like you and I. <laughs> yeah. is, how do I get involved? I've been in it since uh, like September of 1991. My dad had a welding supply company that I grew up in, but he would build buildings and then lease it back to his company, which when I was young, I didn't get that, but it's pretty cool <laughs> in hindsight now. But Very he smart. sold in like in 91. I was kind of important in this company, but he said to me, do you have any interest longer term? I'm like, nah, I was in my 20s and naive. So I, we parted, you know, nothing bad, just he sold and went off and retired. Yeah. And then I had a partner I ran into probably nine months prior to that. And we were building homes on spot lots, just pre-sell, build it, don't even pay for the lot till the end. Like it was on terms without me even knowing back then. I was so naive as a young kid, but that was my start building homes like that. How did you even know the construction and you just knew it from working for your dad through that business from that? There was two things that got that going. I didn't know the construction. I just loved real estate, read all, you know, back in the 80s, read all the chump books and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But then I met a builder when I was running this little side landscape company. And then he was pissed off with this big builder he worked for. And we just started talking, having coffees and whatnot. But then what got it is you would remember this, Earl Nightingale tapes. I had a cassette tape in my <laughs> Honda back then driving to the welding supply business out in New Hampshire. And I heard Earl Nightingale say that during the depression, this guy, I forget who it was, went around to landowners because nobody could sell. And he said, I'll put a sign on your land and I'll pre-sell it. So I got the idea to do that. But then I would get with this builder and put a kind of a builder package together. Yeah. And then we would pre-sell it, collect a deposit. Nobody got paid, subcontractors or land, until that house cashed out with the buyer. I wouldn't even, I don't think I'd have the guts now to go to all the supplies and say, <laughs> you're going to wait till the end, but it worked. No, yeah. I mean, then I think it was more an option. Now everybody is heady about everything. But what yeah. made you know that you would be able to do it? Or were you just have that type of personality at that age where you're like, I'm going to throw it at the wall and see if it works? Well, I had the security of a salary at the welding supply company. I was like a general manager there. So we were playing at first and then two or three went real well. So when he said he, he was thinking of selling, do I want to stay or do I care? I just said, no, go for it. I'll do real estate. But I stayed with that company. This is another punchline. And you're making me think of all this old stuff. Yeah. They, I, <laughs> stayed old. This, I stayed with this company and they were based a little bit, a few towns away from me. I went in like month two and they fired me. So then I was out. He thought he set me up good, and then, but I, they <laughs> fired me. So that was interesting. And so then I was, I had, my kids were like two and three at the time and I had no income, no nothing except for a couple of houses. So we had to get after it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that the loss of the job that you didn't love anyway is the thing that pushes a lot of people into real estate. But I know now as a coach, I'll just meld the two for people who get in that situation now. What would you say is the difference like right now in today's market with everything that's going on in the internet? We didn't have the internet. So we had, it was a different like access phase to how you do real estate. Like when we started, I used to just, my dad would pull foreclosures from courthouse lists. We knew everybody and we would just go open the doors and climb through windows. Like nobody cared. Yeah. I was like a kid climbing through into dumps. And now that's like awesome. you can't do any of that. So no. like for people who would want to do that now and get started, do you think it's harder? And what would be the first piece of advice you would give them to get going? Ah, it's dramatically easier. I remember printing maps out to get somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Google Maps, literally in the 90s. No, it's dramatically easy. You sit behind your computer, you generate leads. If you can pick up the phone, I don't want to 
ever tell anyone it's not a people business. You could pick, because too many people say it is, it's not rather. Pick up the phone and build relationships and solve problems. But it is dramatically easier to answer that question because everything's so automated until you have to go actually make the deal, in my opinion. Yeah, I love what you say. I mean, I, I agree. I think it's fully a relationship business and your ability to build that relationship is what ends up in more deals than people who are just thinking first about the money. The money yeah. part's going to be great, but unless you're good with the people, you're never going to get the money, especially not now with the availability of the internet. We all have the same list. So sellers are getting a bunch of different calls. You have to pick different lists to see what happened. Yeah, I just said this. I do what I call a rant every week on my, um, and you're from New England, so you'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Every Monday they get it in Slack, like 150 of my members. And two Mondays ago, I said, look guys, stop worrying about getting a house on a contract and just really listen to what the heck they're saying and try to solve the problem. And if you don't know how, call us. Like it's that simple. Too many people like, I'm hearing the calls because we critique them, Jonathan. Yeah, we, yeah. we actually do that. And Fantastic. they read the script. I'm like, they just said something wicked important. You just went right by it. So yeah, well, that, just really solve problems. Yeah, and I, I love the solving problems because I think like the first question that I say, unless you know where somebody is going, what are you even talking about? If they have nowhere to go and you can't help them get there, what use are you can tell them you can offer them cash, but what are they going to do with it? They don't know where they're going. And I think well, that's tell like- how good you are. <laughs> yeah, oh, I've done a hundred deals. But I also, like what you said, you can run the list and you can get in there, but there's so many different things that could go wrong unless you're really focused on what you can do long term and the whole process. When did you start learning about the off market acquisition part? Because I know you started, like you said, getting those and doing the bills. But when did you get into kind of doing this, what we're talking about, trying to acquire your own properties direct? Yeah, I because I was a broker for a while. I sold the Cobalt Banker. I really I, since 08 crash is the answer, short answer. But I was in my head from 08 till 12, February to February, literally four years. It almost yeah. like it was clockwork. Because I thought, oh, I, I can't do it. I must have messed up. It was a crash. So from February of 12 onward, I've done nothing but creative real estate. I don't ever take out a bank loan to this day, even though I could. we do everything on terms creatively. Yeah, we'll definitely get into that because I think it's really important for new investors to know there are ways to get in without having money. But you have to have some set of skills and you have to be a people person because you don't, we're not, we don't want to sell people something that we can't deliver on. Right. So to not understand how to do things on terms and all of the options there, you really have to be focused on what you said. Can you solve a problem for someone? And if you can solve the problem, that's where the terms come in, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And if they're not, I want to go back to your people person because I agree with you, but I don't want to dissuade some people to go, I'm not a people, like they tag themselves. I'm not a people person. Look, yeah. if I can dig into your why and I can get you really passionate about it, emotional about it, and then I can show you how to learn the scripts. I promise you, you'll become a good people person. So you don't tag yourself if you think you're not. Yeah, I actually agree with because I actually don't consider myself a people person, but I just care about what's happening to the people involved in the deal. I don't want to go to a party and have small talk. But if I can help someone, that to me is like the people connection. And sure, I can make money, but I can help them not lose their entire house. It's 100% it. me. I, if you put me, my wife would laugh. I've been married 36 years. If you bring me to a social, I could last three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> And all the people in my family love it. I could care less. So I'm an introvert, but I know Same. I solve problems. Same thing. And I, that's a, it's a great thing, though, from two introverts to other people who are introverted. Like, you can be really good at real estate. 100%. I think, like, for us introverts, we're more focused one-to-one -one instead of on creating, like, a big show. No offense to the extroverts, but they know they like that. <laughs> yeah, so how did your whole career transition? I know you went through, you said on market, you had a brokerage and then sold that. And then what was it the crash that turned you into yeah. this... Yeah, to go into this. Yeah, it was this. ugly. It was really ugly. I, I had 20-something properties, Jonathan, and the banks came knocking. And look, if you're a banker, no offense, but you got a job to do too. I get it. I had properties that dropped a half and two-thirds in value, and I'm on there personally. Yeah. That's no leverage. But now if it happened tomorrow, and it's not going to go to that drastic, but if yeah. it did, I have leverage. I have properties that the loans are in the seller's name or their own are financing me. They don't want it back. Yeah. It's a simple real estate conversation versus you signed here, give me everything, including your house and your kids. It's ridiculous. Between those two, though, between subject two and seller financing, is there one that you prefer over the other or that you find easier? Because I think people are interested in both, but they're both different dialogues. Which one do you think might be more accessible or maybe that you like more? Okay. I'm I might give you a market slanted answer, but because sure. I like both out of the three ways I buy, I like those two the best. And I like, so I'll give you both ends. I like owner financing because we focus, Jonathan, mostly on free and clear owner financing. Yeah. 
the building I'm literally sitting and talking to, I bought November of 18 from a very savvy, one of the largest landowners. He passed away sadly since then, but in this area, and he was seeking someone to buy owner financing. The realtors just don't get it. Yeah, so I exactly. bought this owner financing. And why do I love this, this piece of owner financing? Because we make principal only payments. Think about that as a recession hedge and a market changing hedge. And then I love sub two in this market because now rates just went to seven, which is crazy. And I'm buying properties with 2.5, 3.2 interest rates, like literally this week. That's cool. Yeah, I can have those for 20 years. The rate's not going to be there for a little bit, in my opinion. Yeah, sub two is the thing that everybody hopes when they ask if other people's loans are transferable when they buy their house. It's no, but you can figure out if you're doing off market to figure out how to get to sub two. Is there right. something uh, you talked about it because you said something really important. Realtors in general, obviously people who are licensed, I'm licensed as well, but most realtors don't understand the seller finance game and how it started back in the day. And what I always tell people, if you hear the words hold paper, they know what they're doing and they want seller financing yeah. and you can walk right into it. And there's, it's a very smart proposition for sellers. They don't want to take the tax set and they don't need the money up front, right? So that's why you're running the lists at 100% on the equity. So you can focus on people who don't need the money and they maybe their heirs aren't ready for them to transfer. Yeah, I love those lists free and clear. And then I love free and clear and out of state, especially post COVID. That's a, that's a killer list. Yeah, most sellers that do this, like the guy who did this, what do you probably have in mind? Because he passed away. I think he probably was sick and I didn't know that. And he wanted his wife and his kid to have not the tax burden, but a, a stream income. of cash without having the building. That's yep. very smart on his part. No maintenance, income coming in. You yep. talked about the, so 100% and out of state. And we're going into the time where I think that's the best list, especially where both of us live, winter. Because yep. winter's where the bills start piling up. They don't want to pay the heat costs if it's vacant. So that gets even better uh, during the winter time, especially where you are in Massachusetts. Yeah, I'm in Rhode Island, but I, oh, I grew okay. up in Mass. Both we have <laughs> properties everywhere around here. Yeah. But think of the principal only pay down thing. We did a property in the water in Plymouth, which is like Cape Cod, and the woman was a realtor. Okay, so this goes back to the realtor tie of why yeah. she was a realtor and couldn't sell it, and so she sold it to us, and it was twenty five hundred dollars a month principal only. We bought it for nine hundred forty five grand principal only. So you're getting thirty thousand a year down on the principal. And that's just very powerful when the market's changing. You can pay top price if you get your term. That That's the magic. I always love that. You're not calling a wholesale or fix and flip and lowball them. And it's a, the gate comes down when you tell them that. Yeah, I think you can adjust the terms like because you're a, an, a term investor, but you adjust them based on what's happening in the market. So for right. people who always say, oh, the MLS sucks, I don't agree. I'm just looking for properties that have sat or have a little bit like more anomalies than maybe your baby investors or first time buyers can handle. And those are ripe. And when they're sitting long, even people like you said, who are realtors, they know what happens. They want to get rid of the property. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do you have in your database, in your listener database, are there a lot of realtors or at least a few? Yeah, I run a big on market team as well. So I have 50 okay. agents on market. So I know all the agents and we cross market to them as well. Then let me just say this to them directly only because I live that world and I wouldn't. So I'm not in any way downplaying agents. I get it. I will tell you that if I knew I did 100 homes a year, it's not like I just tinkered with it when I was a broker. Yeah. So if I knew what I knew now back then, I, there's not many deals I'd have to walk away from. So picture as a realtor, Every expired listing you have, because we're all not that great, we can't sell them all. <laughs> Every house that the seller said, no, they don't want to pay a commission or they're upside down or they can't, they don't want to short sell. All those deals you can buy and create three exactly. paydays instead of one check. Yep. I'm going to get into the three paydays, but I love that because it's like, if you're doing a big business as a listing agent and you have 50 listings, why aren't you figuring out which one of those you can buy? before. You, there's a lot of options for what you have, but there's other things in the middle. And I never understood why all people who are licensed, they should all be investing. You have the best access, you know, the ARV of the properties, and you can see everything that's vacant right away. Explain the three paydays, because this is part of your coaching and part of your system, because I think it'll be really interesting for listeners. Yeah. And let me comment on what you just said, because it's awesome. The why wouldn't they type comment you made. Look, the you morally and ethically, if you can sit in front of a seller, to your point, and sit with all these properties and go, hey, you know what? Tell me your situation. I'll tell you if I should buy it or list it. Like, I want what's best for you. Your name is going to fly around that town like wildfire yeah. and you will get more business than you can handle. Let me just respond to that before the three paydays because I don't want to miss yeah. that. When we go out, and I'm sure it's similar for you, I like being licensed because when I go out, we have six different options that we can offer 
a seller. There's all sorts of different like iBuyer models. We'll buy direct. We'll help them flip now with another company. We'll, you know, we'll buy for cash. We can do so. There's so many different things. And then if they want the highest price, great. We'll just live because if they want that price, that's not an investor price. I don't want to pay that if you want market price. So So they need their cash. Yeah, exactly. You just take the temperature and it's nice to have all those options. And if you're not licensed, then you're doing off market acquisition. You only have so many options. That's why everyone's so like, Everyone off market is obsessed with, oh, I want to buy quick for cash. You're a great example as that's not even necessary. Right. No, that's Absolutely not the not. only option for people at all. So no. hit us with the three paydays because I think that'll be. Yeah. Awesome. So the three paydays was born out of my frustration, frankly. So when I got back in in 12, I, so what happened for four years, I was in my head, I told you, but in 12, I said, all right, what the heck? I, so what, what will work? I got no money. I moved from a two and a half acre lot looking out over the harbor here in Newport to a one bedroom, 900 square foot apartment with my wife and said, crap, I got to do something to get back on my feet. And it was, all right, I'm not going to ever, ever get paid once on a deal anymore. I'm just not going to do it unless it's a massive deal that I'm in. But I'm not going to do it. I'm going to create a better system. And so when we started looking at the lease purchase exits and the owner financing exits, I said, wait a minute, well, I can get money now if I do it right. I can get continual money, not big, but continual monthly money per house. And then I can get cash outs down the road, which is like building wealth. So I so for any business owner, I get the best of everything. I don't care if I was opening a restaurant, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Money now, money over time and money long term. So the three paydays are my buyers going into a home are buyers that need time. Like post COVID, there's thousands of entrepreneurs going the entrepreneur route from a job yeah. and they need time. They need seasoning. So they come in with a down payment. They were ready to do it. They just can't get a loan yet. That's payday one. Payday two is I pay on the underlying debt on the property or to the seller. And then I collect that plus from the buyer on a monthly basis. We average about 300 bucks on that per house. And then the back end is very big because it's all of the principal pay down throughout the term and my markup. And if I keep, I can work these deals. We call it wealth stacking, Jonathan. I'm sure you do it. But you just, you take an existing sandwich lease or an existing anything. You change the terms of the sub, beneficial to both parties. Yeah. And so we can wealth stack this thing and push them out and out after you solve your cash flow needs. But what's the, I guess, the average time end to end for one of these deals until you're like out? When you're new, you, because you probably more aggressively want the cash, they go from two to five years. At our stage and students that get past like the eight or nine deal mark where they go, oh, I got my bills figured out now. My monthly's good. Then they start looking at creating 10 and 15 and 20 year deal. Those are cool. Yeah. You said something interesting because when you got to the payments in the middle, the part two, the second payday, it's never like a lot for one. I wonder if you agree with me. I feel like a lot of new investors are trying to hit a home run right away. So when they see like a little payment, they don't understand. You just have to keep doing the same thing and scale. I know that's what you coach. But do you see that on the outside for people who are just, they're hungry, but they want everything right away to do not that much work. And they don't have the patience well, to kind of you just described the human race, right? <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So let me say this. I'll give you some metrics. We average our family business. And I'll give you across the nation. Are we, our family business averages around 75 grand per deal, all three paydays. So it takes time. The community average is anywhere from 45 to 250 in higher price for areas. Like I got a guy in California. He's actually one of our coaches now, Russ. Russ has done like his fifth deal. There's no deals under hundred grand, all three paydays. Yeah, no, it's all yeah. high end. Yeah. Yeah. And you can use the system. It's all scalable with price as long as you understand really what you're doing, because there's yep. no price that's going to not, it's not going to work for. It's just a matter, like you said in the beginning, of solving a problem. 100%. Yeah. What do you think with this current market that we're going into, what do you think is going to happen? And you're doing, I think your system is perfectly primed for what's going on now coming up for the next 18 months where rates are still high and there's lots of options out there. Yeah. Here's a couple of metrics. I love, I love real stuff, right? That we're talking. So in the last 50 years, 50, our average interest rate has been 7.7, roughly. Yeah, people we're not forget. even there yet. <laughs> you and I know, I bought my first house at 10%. So you and I know it's good now still. But the younger people are going, oh, it's so high. No, it's not. It's normal. But here's the scary part and the good part, if you can be the guide and learn this. In the last 50 years, this is only the third time that we have an affordability problem. Now, what does that tell you? You have all these buyers that got pushed to the sidewalk, really, sadly. They can't buy now. They think they can. They can on creative finance. So if it's already an affordability problem for the third time in that long of a time frame, what's going to happen when they go up a little bit if they do? More. That's nasty for buyers. Yeah. And that means this whole seller demand just went down. So to your point, it could not have been a better time. In my 31 years, I haven't seen it as far as the timing all coming together like a perfect triangle. 
Yeah. I mean, I think the perspective is great for people like us who've been in it 30 years, because like you said, we understand like these rates aren't high at all. They were just extremely Mm. low. So people got spoiled by thinking they can get under 3% rates. To me, I never really, I was a cash investor for the first like majority of my life and then played around with other lines of credit and thing. But I never really, even when the rates are high and I have to use that, I don't really think about it because I'm always hunting assets and I don't know how you feel about that. Like to me, if I'm a good buyer, if I'm buying correctly, whatever the rates are, are just negligible because I'm trying to buy the best to see. And like you're saying, you have three paydays in there. So there's different ways that you can get out of it as well along the way. Yeah, it's about the return. I agree 100%. It's about the return. We've got to see past that. People looking to join our community will say, oh, I don't know if I can go You do this on my credit card or do this with a loan. Like, why not? You haven't even asked me what the return is. You don't even know what we're doing. So look at the return, not the investment. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what Wicked Smart does in your coaching, because I think there's a ton of companies out there, but I think it's always really, you want to hear from the people. Is this a real thing? How's it helping people? Because yeah. investing is a little bit murky on the side. You never know really what's going on. But you want to hear direct, like how it's helping people. And this is, I think creative financing is really interesting. I think anyone who's an expert in creative financing can help a lot of people who can start doing it on the side and then figure it out long term. Do help a lot of people and live through any market because you know how to, yeah. how to pivot. I'll give you a broad answer and you can tell me if you want to go deeper. So one of my other frustrations when I started coming back in the scene mentally in 2012 was I was frustrated by cool seminars, cool marketing, cool programs. And now in hindsight, I've even talked to people that say, yeah, I don't care. I just market. They just want to sell stuff. I yeah. literally have talked to people off here after podcast and they go, ah, Chris, I don't want to coach. I, I'm a good marketer. And yeah. that's, I guess it's good for them. I'm not going to poo-poo it, but we're the opposite. So our whole company, the mission, our offsite meetings we do, it's all about how many transactions in our associate experience, which is our student experience. Yeah. And so I call it bridging the gap, Jonathan. It's like that time between the gap is, I took a course or I saw a seminar and then I did a deal. That's the gap. And some people are stuck in that forever. I get calls every week. They say, I spent X amount, never did a deal. I said, why? Well, I don't get it. So we're about locking arms and doing deals with people. And we, so it's interactive learning. They do deals. We're with them. We lock arms. They see us do it with them. We call sellers. We do everything with them. After about 10 deals, they can opt to move on or stay with us if they want. But they learn it fast because of that. Yeah, it's... Interesting what you said about the market. I do think there's so many programs that are marketed well. But the one thing that I found out that I think I've even changed my tune on, even things that I think are overly marketed, I think that the biggest failure isn't in the delivery of the product. I think it's just that people want the product to work itself. And that's why it's important that you want to go arm to arm with them because someone will pay, I paid $50,000. Isn't it just going to drive itself like a car? It's no, you still have to do the steps. So I think a lot of people get the resources, even if they're good marketing, they just don't use them because they don't want to do it themselves. You want to hear something crazy? So yesterday I was on the call, mastermind call with my highest group. There's 25 of them or so. One of them's an attorney. We have great people now. Like they left their big jobs that come in. Yeah. And he says, I don't know. It's year end and didn't hit all my goals. And he's, he's whining a little bit. And so someone in the group, not me, said, hey, Paul, how long did you go to law school? He says, I did it fast because he's so fairly smart. He said, seven years. I did between college and law yeah. school. And he said, oh, okay. So you've been with us for 11 months and you're whining. Like, and the guy just cracked up. Like, oh, I get it. I get it. Sorry. And then we got doctors in our group who have been in school forever and they expect to learn this in six months. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm at 30 years, you're at 30 years, and still I could go out on one seller appointment and co- here comes something new that I've never oh, even I love heard it. about. I still learn. That's why I'm here. Love it. Yeah. I think that to me, to be a good investor, you have to really enjoy houses. Do you agree with me? I like the assets. And I think if you're buying at scale, you have to understand. But like in the smaller end, I just like houses. And I like yeah, my learning. Yeah, and I both do. Yeah. It's just such a They have so much to offer. You can create homes long term for people. And I like making money off of them. I think we all have that light bulb moment when you do an investment and then you like sell it and you get paid when you're really young. You're like, well, that's it. (laughs) That's pretty easy. When you started selling those homes in the beginning, is that how it felt like the first one that you built and sold? You're like, that was it. That wasn't that hard. I remember the old checkbook on the big (laughs) ledger. And I think our first profit was like, I don't know, like 22 grand. I, that was like earth shattering. I was 20 something years old. And I went, oh, I should do this like five, six, six, 10 times a year. Yeah, that was the same. I made 20,000 on my first flip in Florida. And it wasn't even a flip. I just bought in a development, painted it, 
and fix some tile. <laughs> and no one else was doing anything. It was like all old people. So it was just quick and done. And then you realize that's not that hard. But similar, my, my dad was an investor and I learned all this stuff from him growing up. And then I processed it as I got older. But like you said, I didn't really know all of what I knew until I started doing it. And then I was like, yeah. okay, it's really starting to work. So what do you, in terms of your personal investments now as a family, what do you guys invest in? So we stayed doing the same model we teach. It's just that when other things come across our plate, like this building, this is a great building. I inherited tenants. I started cash flow positive. I principal, you know, so when stuff comes across, I know how to pivot and take it or not. Then we'll pointedly target four to 10 unit buildings that are free and clear. We've done a few of those. I do them in my IRA. So there's a lot of cool, fun things like that. Now we're doing a ton of deals though with the students where we partner with them. Yeah. And, and so it's the same. I'm doing deals. I'm just doing more of them and I'm getting a lesser share of them. So we partner with the students. Yeah. You're there to coach them through it. And I think it helps knowing that you have a part of it too, because you don't yeah. want to lose. There's the, yeah. that kind of culpability there to make sure that it goes well. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that those partnerships, I mean, how do you feel about partnerships in general? Take it out of the student zone because because we all grew up as investors. We A lot of us tried partnerships. They were always difficult for me. I want to know how you feel about them, especially when you got started. Yeah. My building business ended in not a great partnership. I've seen the gentleman at a wedding locally before and we we're, were amicable, but it didn't end great. It wasn't so ugly that I couldn't go and talk to him, which we, but now I'm with my son-in-law and they are my partners. And then I have a, an equity partner who built it just recently because of what we've been doing. He built the largest franchise in the world for fitness. One of the largest in the US. Sorry. And I don't know. I, if I'm controlling it, Jonathan, I'm very comfortable. I think you do have to be careful in hindsight. Should I, could I have made that building relationship better? Yeah, I was immature. Maybe yeah. it was his fault, my fault. But so I won't blame anyone. It's probably me. So I like it all by myself, though, because every time, even with family, you, you make decisions. You go, oh, man, it's just different to have to include everyone. So there's pros and cons <laughs> to everything. I tell you, the family part I love because I get at my age to hang out with my kids every day. That's unique. I'm trying. My kids are 21 and 19. And I'm like, let's go. Let's go. Come on. Yeah, let's do awesome. it. Soon, it's just going to be buy a multifamily, put them in it and let them manage it and figure it out. So they're both ready for that. Let's talk about your books, uh, just the general principles through some of them. Real estate on your terms, that's what is really what your business is, right? Main one. Yeah. yeah. So that was the first one. But right during COVID, literally, I think we went home in March, end of March, beginning of April, went home to work, closed the office. And that book was in revision. So what was cool about it was we got to do a lot of COVID and post-COVID stuff in it. And that's so that's got revised in uh, 20. But what, what's the third term? Because we said sub two and seller financing. What's the other one? Because you said there's lease three. Lease purchase. Oh, yeah, okay. Lease purchase. Leases. Yeah. Can and you explain Texas, that a little? Yeah. yeah. So you control. This is great for new people. So because this guy, Brian in Illinois, did his first eight like this just for comfort level. He didn't want to buy. He didn't yeah. want to take ownership. So I tie Jonathan's property up with a lease purchase contract. I do cloud the titles to protect my interests. So I have an equitable interest. And then I go exit it by putting a rent to own client, same as my other deals in that property. So the sandwich is buyer, seller, me in the middle, the meat, the meat or the cheese. You just can't do that in Texas. But other than that, to the best of my knowledge today, we do it in every other state. Yeah, it's safe. I think you have to do exactly what you're doing. You have to be trained to do it. And then you can do it multiple times. I think it's hard for someone to just one off a lease purchase and then say, Oh, now I'm going to do an Airbnb. Like you, you have yeah, to yeah. really get it to get it. Do you find that your students focus on one more than the other? Or they like all three, depending on what their list they're building? I see different palettes like that. Because the guy Brian, I mentioned is by far one of five top people in our community, but he did his first eight deals, lease purchase, maybe just a little more conservative when I say palette. But let me so let me tell you how that went there where he is now. So he did eight. And then that was like, I don't know, eight months ago, nine months ago. And they his all three paydays were over 800 grand. He started seeing the light. And then he said, ah, now I see why you want to own them. Because when you go to cash, so it's not necessarily a headache, but it could be more of a headache when people get amnesia and forget how you help them. <laughs> yeah. You don't have the deed, right? Yeah, they will get amnesia, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what we call the title. But still, you don't want that. So then he said, I actually have him speaking at our match event. And the topic I just designed this morning is, Transitioning from sandwich to sub two, because now you look at the portfolio and you call them. We call this wealth stacking and you call them and you renegotiate and you buy it. And now the three year deal or four year turns into a 20. And so he's doing that now. But your aunt, to answer your question, I think it's about a mix because some people come right in and go, I got a lead. Just tell me which way to go. And they let us steer that. And if they put the seller's best interest in mind and always do the right thing, they'll be fine. Yeah. Interesting. All right. On the new rules of real estate investing, is that also related to your terms? 
Some of the chapters are, my son and son-in-law wrote uh, at least a chapter each. They both have totally different stories, but very cool stories. Yeah. And then in it are 24 other people that people I had on my podcast, actually, Jonathan. That awesome. We transcribed, and then I thought it was cool to put them in this. So I'm not, because I'm not so naive to think everybody has to do creative real estate, even though I think so, but I know <laughs> that's not normal. So there's tax liens and there's other things in there. And then just as a side note, when I said the stories, Zach was a bartender and a personal trainer, my son-in-law. No real estate experience. Now he does hundreds of deals and runs a company with me. And my son, Nick, was in a coma and doctors told us he wouldn't walk, talk, or eat again back in 03. And oh my you would God. never know. It. And he's running the company. So, and he's a speaker. So they're very cool stories in that book that they get to share. Yeah, I think one thing that our listeners here can get from this is I really think we both think anybody can be an investor. And you can start without money and help people and figure out how to get the capital. I just yeah. don't, it's a great thing to not think, okay, you don't have to have a college degree or an advanced degree, but you do have to be ready to do the work because it's- We have, I agree. We have everything from my son who said, dad, I don't want to go to college after that injury. Teach me, put me through your curriculum, which I did. All the way to, I'm talking to a CEO of a publicly traded company who just retired, who wants to come in at our highest level. Like that's, that. mostly right now we're dealing with people from the W2 that want to escape. Yeah. Yeah. That, and especially now, if you look at all the layoffs, like current, like we're right now, we're recording, it's November, 2022. There's layoffs coming at all of the tech companies and they're getting good severance. So they're going to have bonus money to put in. And a lot of people that I've talked to over the years in my investor portal, everybody's interested in real estate. They just yeah. don't know how to take the first step. And like exactly what happened to you, sometimes getting laid off is the thing that pushes you into it full time, but you need a framework. What I can already tell from what you guys do is that you have a real framework. If you're talking about stacking, that means there's multiple opportunities to make more money. And I think that helps people instead of there's not a one trick pony there where it's, oh, it didn't work. You're out. We can't help you. Great. Yeah, great. On sell with authority for real estate investors, is that based on dialogues or is it just about how to close the deals? That's actually the sell with authority is actually how to become the authority in your marketplace, oh, okay. how we did it and how about seven students did it. They're in there, the stories, because you mentioned earlier, I think they had the iBuyers and all these national companies that come in. And I said to my students, how about you differentiate yourself? And it's very clear that you're the authority, you're the expert. They don't want to go to them. They want you, the local authority. So we talk about that in there. And that was a bestseller just like right off the press, like a month and a half, two months ago. Yeah. I mean, I... Real estate books are really helpful to people because I think, like you said, a lot of people want to scale out of that nine to five. Almost every person that we've probably all talked to over, they're always reading the books well before they get like in in it. That's why they always reference either Rich Dad, Poor Dad or one other book that just jettisoned them in there. Do people find your coaching program through the books or is it just all organic at this point? A lot of it through the books. I have a link for you. I'm happy to have your tribe get the free Absolutely. book. And it's not one of those get the free book, but give me your credit card for shipping. Yeah. We do it all. Yeah. We won't put it out. So yeah, it's a big funnel for us, a big lead generation for us. And then just me being out on shows in general in our podcast, speaking about authority, same thing. That's uh, what they speak. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about your podcast, how long it's been going and how do you find the medium? Because I had two podcasts before. This is my first investing podcast, but I was listening to all of them before. I find them hugely valuable. I love it. The reason I, okay, I'll give it two reasons. One, the, three, the authority piece. The, when you have that, yeah. you establish authority. Two, I like it because I get to meet amazing people. A lot of our relationships for our company yeah. were built over the years through the podcast. Crazy. And then to answer your question, we started, I think, like 17. We we're up to almost 400 episodes. I like it. We went from one show a week to two back to and our listenership went up again. So I'm just going to keep it going with that. I wouldn't let go of the relationship factor piece of it. I love it. Yeah, I really like what you said, the first point of the authority piece. And I think because people can listen to you, you can tell when somebody's BS and when somebody's not, and when they really right. have knowledge and when they're not. And I think that, especially over the long term, you listen to two, three, four episodes, you're like, okay, like they you get, get it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you feel like it's, and they, it's tangible. You can go on the website, find out, hop on Zoom. And I think that's really what newer investors need. In terms of like mindset, because I really created this podcast to talk about like the mindful approach to real estate, how to stay calm and not get like too worked up. What are some pieces of advice that you would have over your 31 years that like going into this market right now, you have brand new investors and people just getting started. What's like a couple pieces of advice to keep them just a little bit more grounded in the process instead of getting like overhyped over deals and so desperate to buy a deal that they make a terrible deal and then they're done. Yeah, I've done all that and seen all that. Um, 
Okay, a couple of things. I had a coach say to me once, this was in the 90s. I was getting like anyone else in real estate. When you have a deal, it's happy, 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 happy. The deal dies and now you're in the dumps. You, so you have this major fluctuation. He said, draw two lines, like an inch apart, like thin, right? Boom, parallel lines. And he just drew a line like this. He said, keep your emotions within the lines. So here's happy, here's bummed out. He said, you are going to drive yourself nuts in real estate. And it just really hit home. It's about as simple as you can get. But the real way to do that is what I think is to pick a niche that you like can get behind because they're all different, right? My my avatar tends to care about people and helping people. Okay, so if that's you, great. Second, pick someone like you or I who have been through cycles. This is critical. It's not just because yeah. because Jonathan and I are on the show. I'm telling you, this will kill you if you don't do it right because there's people that started after 08, and I hate to say it, but they don't know what's going to come. <laughs> and then the third thing is put the blinders on for three years. When you go into something with this going, I'm in it for three years, you're not going to freak out either way, good or bad, in my opinion. Those three steps would be the best answer I can give you for just keeping the emotion between the lines. Yeah, those are rock solid. I do think, I mean, honestly, I think our introverted nature does help because we're definitely more like even keel as introverts. I don't really get too up or too down. But I think if you're analytical in how you buy and you also have enough experience looking at properties, you kind of already know. Like to me, I always say it's just about how much money I'm going to make. I'm not going to lose money on a deal. I've been doing this too long. If I do, okay, great. I'll get the deposit back. I made a bad decision. But I yeah. think that level of calmness is really important. And that comes with experience. And one, especially something else that we talked about is having a community of peers. We do a bunch of meetups with investors and they always say like, oh, what do you do at the meetup? Nothing. We just like talk. You just yeah. meet other investors. We have no pitches for you. We're just like, doing it. And we've found that investors meeting other investors like they do through what you guys do. That's what gives people the confidence to do it because they just need to see that other people just like them. They're just like, oh, that guy over there just did seven deals last year. You're like, what? He's just like in a t-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Like It doesn't take much. It takes a dedication to wanting to be like you said, I think you have to want to help people to be a good investor really long term, because eventually it'll catch up with you if you're over number focused. I agree. And I think the community piece is huge. Your meetup does it. Our community does it. I can miss being on Slack for three days and a brand new student that I don't even know yet can ask a question and get 20 answers. That's yeah. community. And that's why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you think it's going to go in the next 18 months? I feel like it's a good time for investors like us. I think it's always a good time because I think there's always deals based on the market. But what do you think? Because I think some people are in a chronic panic if they can sell or if they have to buy. But I really don't. We again, like you said, we both went through 2008. It wasn't pretty for me either. So this is nothing. (laughs) I agree. I agree. And it's nothing also because even if it went that route in the next three months, I'm cool with it because I'm not on any loans. Where do I think it's going to be? I don't know because the billionaires don't, no one knows. You can listen to the yeah. news and they'll think they do. They don't. <laughs> no so idea. They don't. Uh, elections come in, things, I don't know. I think things are going to stay about where they are or slide in the 10% range, but I don't know. Nobody knows. All I know yeah. is this. I know it's going to keep changing. And I know that if you learn or when you learn how to do what Jonathan and I have been speaking about, okay, now you don't care. My wife will say to me, Rach just went to this day. We've been married 36 years. Rach just did this. So how do you think it's going to affect your business? She always asks, inquisitively. And I say, I love it. I don't care what it does. Tell me next week what it is and we'll tell the community how to pivot. Yeah. And that's been that way since the 90s. I remember when they were talking about realtor commissions tightening up. And I said, great, it's going to flush out all the garbage realtors. So when the media's screaming, don't be in real estate, just use that as a huge flag to go, I'm in. That's exactly. what you should do. It, it, th- I completely agree. When the widespread panic is out there. That's the best time to be investing because the people who are scared opt out. That just means there's more opportunity for us. They need your help. Yeah, and nothing, none of that, I'm the same as you. None of that even phases me. I don't even watch the real estate news because what do I care? I'm focused on my clients, my database, and who needs help. That doesn't change whether the market's high or low. It's just a different, like you said, it's a different pivot that I need to make. Different tactic, 100%. Awesome. This has been great. I really appreciate it. It's great to meet you as well. Yeah, I know you too. But this has been great. I'll add everything in the show notes. We're the best place for everyone to get in touch with you is smartrealestatecoach.com. Yeah, that's a general site. Definitely grab the books. We send you two out of the four for free. Again, we'll ship it at our cost. It's wickedsmartbooks.com, wickedsmartbooks.com forward slash zen. So we know you came from Jonathan's show. We're going to honor that for everyone that comes. There's no rush. There's no do it now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Whenever you want to do it, you do it. We'll ship it out. I literally sign them personally when I'm in town. I'm about to go do that next and we'll get them out to you. 
Yeah, fantastic. And we'll link to everything that you sent in the show notes. But I mean, you really provide extreme high value. I know you do this a lot, but I do this a lot as well. And I find there's just a lot of BS in real estate investing. And it's nice to talk to other people who are just like, Likewise. obviously yep. straight shooter. Let's just help people and get this What going. you're really saying is more people should be from New England. You shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Let's just take a little trip, see what it's like over in our parts. I mean, they can avoid the winter if they Come want. Come see us in March. Come to our event. Yeah, exactly. All right, Chris, I really appreciate you taking Thanks, the time buddy. to come on. It's been an absolute pleasure. This has been episode 23, Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Chris Prefontaine of Smart Real Estate Coach and the Wicked Smart Companies. Chris, thanks again for coming on. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends. And be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. 